For some, eucalypts have a bad reputation. People think that they're only big trees and they think that the branches drop off dangerously and without notice. I think the last bit is actually true because when I was in Australia, I met someone who showed me a photograph of what had happened to her mum's house. But that said, <laughs> I flip and love a eucalyptus. Tom Hartdyke is creator of the World Garden and he's the president of the Australasian Plant Society here in the UK. He is the holder of one of two national collections of eucalyptus that we have here in the UK. I think for the, the national collection of eucalypts it's been absolutely it meant so much to me to have that. They're a really diverse group of trees, which means that they don't have to be big. In fact, some are really just knee height. They're such a graceful and majestic tree. They're actually a really useful garden tree as well because they're well adapted to dry conditions, which means they're drought tolerant. And since many of the species are fast growing, that means that you can get height quickly, you can get shade, privacy, and all the benefits of a grown tree in a relatively short space of time, if and when that's needed. Plus they're evergreen and they often have really striking bark patterns, which means that they can be a really stunning tree, even in winter. So, I will let Tom tell you how we built this national collection. It's really interesting. He actually collected some of the seed for these plants himself. This was on the same trip that Tom actually got kidnapped and held hostage. It was a byproduct of me collecting in Tasmania that we got the collection. In 2009, we awarded it. So in 1997, I applied, well, I actually rang up Wisley and asked them if they did grants they said yes to young horticultural students under 25 who are enthusiastic qualifications or not that's fine as long as you're really going to fulfill the project uh, so to write up the project when you come back so I suggested three months in Tasmania to collect if I'm allowed to do so seed of potentially hardy woody plants such as eucalyptus trees acacias bottle brushes and so on and they said so when's the project for and I said it's probably in 1999 they said well that's two years away I said well I'm, I'm leaving in two weeks sorry you leave <laughs> I mean it was typical Tom and they said and I wouldn't get off the phone they can't get rid of this bloke on the phone whoever it was at the RH they sent me a check for 500 quid <laughs> I mean you would not now that's not what happens now you've got right, a procedure right, right. and your forms to fill in uh, they wanted me off the phone to send him a check and they did <laughs> and once they did then other people then followed including the Kent Gardens Trust okay, a local yeah. charity to gave right. me the money to, and they matched the RHS so it was a thousand pounds and that paid for my entire trip when I was there in Tasmania yeah thousands of pounds would stretch further then it really would yeah. stretch it did stretch further then yeah I was already flying out to, to spend a year in Southeast Asia looking for plants and a bit of time in the States afterwards okay and a whole year in Australia but Tasmania for those three months three and a half months I spent there I fulfilled the grant did I fulfill the grant I've got about 128 <laughs> collections of these different things right. mostly eucalyptus trees, acacias and the calistamins which I'm surrounded around now in the miniature Australia and the miniature Tasmania that's over there. Almost all of the plantings I'm surrounded by are from that time in Tasmania. You at that stage would have been how old? 18, yeah. 18, so where 19. Where did you get the idea from? Well, I just, the rang, up. <laughs> I just rang up the RHS and said, do you do any grants? Yes. And it was all <laughs> very odd. It's when I said, well, I'm leaving in two weeks. They're like, so you're leaving but you're but the grant you're asking for is in two years' time. <laughs> yes, well, I plan to travel for two for two years, do you? I mean, the guy on the phone, <laughs> I don't know who he was. I just ran him and rang up the RHS at Wisley. And they just, he was obviously enthusiastic. No idea, Tom Hart died, not, who's that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. And they said, just, I think they, I'm sure they sent me a check in the post to get me off the phone. <laughs> I mean, there was no forms to fill in or anything. Some right. were at the time, but it was very relaxed. Now it's different, mm -hmm. but they were so nice and they don't regret it because so many of the plants, the eucalyptus I brought back are now growing at Kew Gardens. They're growing there as well. Princess of Wales Conservatory, the collection there. THD, it says on the number. Like, yes, THD, <laughs> THD. It, was, it meant so much during that trip and I don't know, just cemented the reason of travelling abroad. Yes, backpacking and seeing different places and being the tourist, yes, but you had a scientific mission of bringing back these plants. That really did consolidate the whole trip. It, it, it was brilliant and fulfilled the, the obligation of writing up the trip and all the expeditions are then held at, I think it's Wisley one of them, and at also the Lindy Library in London too. Oh, the they Lindy Library. They store them there. Yeah, yeah, so they're yeah. all there for people to see, for people to observe, and that was the main mission. Yeah. So it was great. Okay, the project was written up a year and a half later than it should have been because I was kidnapped in Colombia. <laughs> but they said that was fine, you're not oh, dead. Could, well you got done. an excuse. <laughs> got an excuse. <laughs> Did you go on your own? I did. Yeah, it's I do the best travel. Way, isn't it? Traveling on your absolutely right. Traveling on your yeah, own is especially if you've way got the an, best a, way. Like a proper mission. Yeah, yeah. it's sometimes people say, "Selfish, Thomas." 
someone said to me the other day, it's quite selfish. Yeah, perhaps it is. But you haven't got people to rely on. Mm -hmm. um, you injure yourself, it's your own fault. You should, you know, you don't have to rely on anybody else. And you can just absolutely tunnel vision where you want to go. It's it's absolutely the best way to travel, especially at that age. Well, yeah, a quarter yeah. of a century ago. Gosh, <laughs> yeah. At that age, it worked really well. You do think, though, if you'd been in a spot of bother, you had seriously fallen off a rock or something, 40, 50 foot into a valley or something, or fallen out of a tree, you do wonder, where's the backup? Well, there isn't any. Yeah. You're in the middle of the wilderness of Tasmania. I mean, you really are in trouble. But at the time, the youth thing on my side, perhaps at the time, you, you winged and risked the whole thing with yeah. huge success. But looking back at it, could you have had a, a partner with you at the time? Could you have employed a local to help you out with more information about where to find these things who accompanied you? Probably. When you found stuff, how could you identify the species? Yeah. You're right. The identification of the species in Tasmania, in Peru, Bolivia, very tricky sometimes. Some of the eucalyptus trees, I'm as new to them in Tasmania. I've never been to Tasmania, never been to Australia before. OK, I've read up on eucalypts, but I didn't know much about them. Uh -huh. Let alone identification. Some of them are so similar. Then you get these hybrid swarms, these hybrids in the wild. Bees cross them all, and it's so confusing as to what's what. So often I didn't know. However, I happened to bump into having a world conference on eucalyptus in Tasmania, and the world's authority on eucalyptus <laughs> called Dean Nicole okay. and he's got the biggest collection on, on the planet right. his place in an outside Adelaide Currency Creek Arboretum and I said any herbarium specimen or photo I had uh. rattled off the whole lot and identified the entire Gosh, collection yeah. for me so and I think if I hadn't had him I would have gone to a a botanic, the Hobart Botanical Gardens, okay. which was actually quite in early stages at that time in the 90s. It's now right. fully a staff, fully fledged botanic garden. So you would have gone to the local botanist, or when you'd come back, perhaps a visit here to Wisley for identification. But ideally, when you're in the host country, yeah. their knowledge more than the not is going to be better as it's the plants for that area. When you collected the seed, did you also take photographs? I did. Is that and how I collected, you had to do it? Uh, you're right. So I collected the seed, uh, often in these gum nuts, these woody capsules that the seed are in, can often okay. last for many years years and you can then dry them on a by a little radiator in the backpack as you were staying if you've been i was camping for three months pretty much solid on my own middle of nowhere so i tried to collect them dry if i could and kept them in camera film cases when i got back to the youth hostel took them out of the camera film case and dried them on bits of serviettes or <laughs> handkerchiefs or something on a radiator they then open up uh, the valves would open up and I'd tap out the seed and put them in the camera film cases again completely dry and then send them home to mum this is so cool to store them in the <laughs> fridge at Lullingston yeah. had to be kept about sort of five, six, seven degrees quite cool and the, like, their longevity will last for a generation or more whereas at room temperature the, the viability has gone in about a year or so so right. with those sort of seeds so we stored them in the <laughs> fridge and dad would go around to try and get an evening meal he's like there's no food in the fridge <laughs> just Tom seeds boxes of these things <laughs> of course being away for three years meant the lot was being sent home yeah, but yeah, I'm so yeah. pleased I did all that. All got home, nothing was lost in the post. Wow. But seed collecting, yes, absolutely. No living plants, no soil, anything like that. But I did bring back herbarium specimens. So you can actually, I pressed a lot of the eucalyptus leaves, the gum nuts, flowers, and fruits, and you could actually see when you got back that's the parent of something I've collected. Is the offspring different to the parent? I've oh, still yeah. got them in the gatehouse actually. Where, where I live, some of the herbarium specimens. Uh -huh. But you're allowed to do that then. A lot's changed. You can't do all of this now, pretty much. Really? It's very okay. difficult. It's become much more restrictive now. Right. Plant collecting and so on. When you came back to the UK after, obviously, the ordeal, how long a gap did you have before you started writing up the project? The gap was about two and a half weeks of just sweating <laughs> out, <laughs> nightmares, sleeping, just like waking up in a pool of sweat. Right. I mean, it was just, just I guess, just exuding all that bad vibes yeah. from Columbia, I suppose. That was my way. I didn't have any, any nightmares or anything. I, well, that I remember. Just sort of exuding all that energy and sweat. It was weird until about the beginning of the year 2001. So we got back for Christmas 2000, so about a week, late, week, two weeks later, I thought, right, I've got to do these projects. So the mm. RHS did bring up and said, Tom, we heard about the kidnapping. I'm really <laughs> sorry about that, but have you got your project yet? <laughs> And the local ch charities, or the Kent Gardens Trust, they wanted a, a write-up too. So I wrote, wrote it all up. Actually, wrote, I took most of the year to do it, but I eventually did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, well done. Yeah, it was quite fun. <laughs> Even the story becomes like, an artefact of that era. Yes, yeah, and written up and having the project of writing 
out, quite be quite disciplined in doing, almost like writing a book. They had to be quite detailed what I'd written up, and of course, all my notes were sent home a year and a half earlier. <laughs> that I had to remember exactly where the plant was I'd collected and writing it all up. But to have that on computer, but also a hard copy of it in the Lindy Library, yeah. really feel like you've done your bit. People will use that as a reference in the future. Yeah, and that is that's a real buzz. Would you like to tell us about your national collection status for the eucalyptuses? Are there any specific plants that you would like to highlight? I think for the national collection of eucalypts, it's been absolutely, it meant so much to me to have that. It was a byproduct of me collecting in Tasmania that we got the collection. In 2009, we awarded it. And we did the first ever display of eucalyptus trees at an RHS show, probably any show in Great Britain in 2011 it was a super show we got silver gilt just one point short of the gold medal <laughs> it was a brilliant show and the main one that i really love to highlight it's not growing actually in this section of tasmania it's just over by one of the polytunnels the australasian polytunnel there is eucalyptus marispii the world's rarest eucalyptus tree and i collected it from just a handful of trees just south of hobart right on the coast and it's not that hardy on paper you would think it's not from a cold area right on the coast mediterranean sort of style climate but yet it's got genes in it of eucalyptus gunnii there's quite oh, closely allied for cider gum which a lot of people do plant therefore i thought it'd be quite hardy surely and it has proven to be quite hardy i don't know anywhere else unless they've got it from here where marispi is growing outside so yeah. and also the world's smallest eucalyptus tree which eucalyptus, is eucalyptus vernicosa i got from the hearts mountains national park in southwestern Tasmania, the wetter part of Tasmania. It grows mature, oh, at about two foot tall. It looks <laughs> like a box or a hebe rather than actually a eucalyptus. Right. It's struggling, it's not fully hardy and struggling away in the southwestern section of the mini Tasmania here. Just trying to showcase a wide range of them and the different foliage, especially now they've been cut down in the winter, all the new epicormic shoots that have come to life and produced this foliage look superb. I mean, it's a florist delight. They florists love you because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they last so they last long in water, and it's that variation of juvenile foliage that I love. And we've yeah. got about sixty different varieties, including the ones in the polytunnel as well. And what does epicormic mean? Epicormic is a unique to a few trees. Epicormic growth. So with eucalyptus trees, it is dormant growth buds in the stem, basically, especially at the base of the stem. Okay. And it's after fire, a bad winter, or a browser eating it with the top gets bitten off, fire goes through, fire goes through, or a bad winter, they'll produce these epicormic growth from these dormant buds that are underneath the bark. Mm. And they produce the amazing regrowth, which is why you can often coppice a eucalyptus tree, especially a younger one, and mm. it will reshoot for you. It's only unique to, unique to eucalyptus trees, but there aren't many trees that produce those epicormic shoots. So adaptable to so many di different conditions, eucalyptus. Almost all of the plantings I'm surrounded by are from that time in Tasmania. That's so cool. So cool. And collecting plants from the coldest regions in Tasmania, as high altitude as possible, cold valley systems where the cold air sinks into these valleys. So going to an area where it's very cold, therefore it's a fair bet the seed that you collect, the offspring will be hardier than if you collected them from near the coast or somewhere else in Australia. And yeah. that's been proven pretty accurate. However, we were hit last December. Most of these were trees a year ago to 30 feet. They're now coppice stems, as you can see, all the new growth surrounding me. But it actually has rejuvenated the collection really well. So going to the coldest spots that I could go to in Tasmania to collect these eucalyptus trees was the only way to try and grow as many outside as possible. This is before the world garden idea was even established, <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. Totally. It was before I was kidnapped in Colombia, but it gave me the absolute absolute kick in the bum to go abroad and to get these plants so backpacking's one thing and seeing places yes but i had that side mission of a grant from the rhs and kent gardens trust to go and collect potentially hardy woody plants it gave me such incentive um, for my trips abroad it was the most successful plant hunting trip i'll ever do and to date the most successful plant hunting trip i've ever done it was brilliant and the mm. rhs are now growing some of these trees at rosemore down in devon oh, yeah. at wisley 
and the Royal, Botan Royal Botanic Gardens at Edinburgh are growing quite a few of the eucalypts that I brought back. So, oh, wow. absolutely super trip. Tom, I have reached the end of my questions. Many, many thanks. Thank you for surviving Tom's <laughs> answers. If you can't tell by now, I'm a massive fan of this genus. They're beautiful trees and they're useful. If you'd like to hear more from Tom and his adventures and what he's managed to create with the World Garden since that heart-stopping moment when he got threatened at gunpoint and told he only had five hours to live, then watch this video next.